thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is Emily Johnson. I'm the gallery manager here at the University Galleries. Um, and I'm really excited that you could be here for this special event. Uh, before we get started, I just want to extend uh, gratitude to those who helped make this exhibition possible. Uh, I first want to thank the panelists, environmental science professors, Martin Becker, Mick Griffiths, and Nicole Davi for sharing their expertise with us today and for the department's enthusiastic interest in this collaboration. A special thanks to gallery director Kristen Evan excuse me, Evangelista for her guidance in planning this exhibition and for granting me this tremendous opportunity. Also, thank you to Tom Uline, uh, professor of art, for the beautiful uh, catalog design. The catalogs are in the back of the room and also on the chairs um, that are complimentary for this exhibition. Uh, thank you to Heidi Rempel for her ongoing support to the University Galleries and to our dedicated staff of students, Dave Distilio, Megan Fletcher, Davy Peralta, Morgan Francis, Christina Sterneski, J Jacob Eppinger, and to Mitchell Sibesma, who's given a lot of his time preparing this event today. I also want to thank the video crew and the photographers for their help. Um, next, I'd like to introduce the panelists in more detail. Uh, Martin Becker is a professor of environmental science at William Patterson University. His research interests include fossils of bony and cartilaginous fishes from the Paleocene and Cretaceous eras, and zeolite mineralogy in New Jersey. Becker's research has sent him around the country recovering fossilized remains from the eras to put together a hidden record of marine life in geologic deep time, and he's been published in many peer-reviewed journals. Along with his extensive field work, Becker is also interested in working with teachers and students at revitalizing earth science education and curriculums. Next, we have Michael Griffiths. He serves as the environmental science chairperson and assistant professor at William Patterson University with a history of research in climatology, geoscience, and speleothem chemistry. He earned his PhD in environmental science and geochemistry at the University of Newcastle. Griffiths research centers around climactic variability and extremes, including the use of isotopes found in corals and cave formations to create records of envi environmental change in monsoon regions. He has contributed to many articles regarding paleoclimatism and has been awarded a research assistantship as a postdoctorate fellow with the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And last but not least, Nicole Davi is an assistant professor of environmental science at William Patterson University and an adjunct associate research scientist at the Tree Ring Laboratory at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Davi's research focuses on developing and interpreting high-resolution paleomatic records in order to further our understanding of past natural and recent anthropogenic climate change over the past 2,000 years. She often works with students, teachers, public audiences, and artists to communicate the excitement of scientific explorations and the significance of the results. I'd like to just begin with a brief overview of the exhibition in case you haven't had a chance to view it for yourself. Um, then we will have presentations by each of the scientists. Uh, if you could just save your questions at the end of the science presentations, um, we can ask them specific ones at that time. Um, and then we'll discuss a, very, a variety of topics as it relates to both the artists in the exhibition and to the scientists' research. Um, to get it started, the photographers in this exhibition utilize scientific research, conduct experimental studies, or embark on expeditions to capture the passage of time through changing landscapes, organic life cycles, or celestial activity. And much like the panelists, their work spans various timescales. Embodying the scientific spirit, Caleb Charlin's photography is prompted by his insatiable curiosity. You can see his work in the corner there. Always eager to question what we think to be true, Caleb insists that even in the well-tested laws of science there are, and must always be, pathways to reinterpretation and discovery. He re-examines existing theories, stages new experiments, and interprets their findings, producing imagery best captured through the photographic process. While growing bacteria on the surface of film, he discovered that the growth patterns were transferring particles, leaving behind microbial evidence of life, or what he calls his biographs. Each of his images depicts a bacterial lifescape, scanned when its resources were depleted and the life cycle complete. Perhaps more meaningful and complex than a traditional microbiological slide, Caleb's photographs contain a comprehensive yet minute lifespan depicted during its brief stint on Earth. 
next to Sharon Harper's work, which you'll see over here. Although we may often view technology as an interruption of our personal experience with nature, Sharon Harper embraces its ability to create images that would otherwise go unseen, thereby enhancing our appreciation of the natural world. Using the camera as a mediating device in her Moon Studies and Star Scratches series, right here, she charts the relationship between the artist, the camera, and the movement of Earth, illustrating our ever-present connection with our surrounding environment. By offering timestamps, geographic locations, and exposure times for each of her works, the artist not only maps celestial activity, but she provides a visual account of life at one particular place and time in the extensive history of the universe. For the artist, these images are an attempt to record a realm we can hardly fathom, but within a framework of time we can readily understand, bringing the human scale into relationship with the cosmic. Christina Seely, whose work you'll see here, and I hope you'll have time to video or view the video room in the back, uh, she sets out on expeditions to the Arctic and tropics to explore what it means to bear witness to environmental change on a global scale. The photographs and videos on view from her Markers of Time series focus on the effects of climate change and suggest not only the gravity of the problem, but the urgency required to protect the planet's natural systems. As the artist presents us with imagery of individual animals in their rapidly changing environments, the viewer cannot help but compare the animals' lives to their own. This personal association allows us to see ourselves and ultimately humanity as more than the problem, but as part of the potential solution as well. Christina explains that by tying the viewer as individual to the global, this work generates an essential dialogue in a climate of growing uncertainty about our future relationship with the planet. And last but not least, Rachel Sussman's work, which you'll see over there. Uh, for her series, The Oldest Living Things in the World, Rachel Sussman consulted biologists, scoured scientific journals, and set out on field work expeditions to photograph continuously living organisms of at least 2,000 years of age on all seven continents. Inspired by the concept of deep time, which the artist describes as a framework in which to consider time scales, too shallow for our physical experience and too big for our brains to process meaningfully, Sussman sought to create a visual archive that puts into perspective the human lifespan. By personifying her subject matter as individuals, rather than elements of a landscape, she's able to emotionally connect her viewers with these portraits of life and prompt us to want to extend these lives. With environmental conservation in mind, the artist asserts, the more we access deep time, the more easily accessible it becomes, and the more likely we are to engage in long-term thinking. The more we embrace long-term thinking, the more ethical our decision-making becomes. These artists make scientific concepts more accessible, understandable, and relatable, and as a result, their photography serves as a lens for the greater need of environmental awareness. They connect the viewer as an individual to their subject matter as means to express the fragility of life, the vulnerability of our planet, and the wonder of the natural world. Let us now take a few moments to hear from each of the panelists about their research projects. And we will start with Martin Becker. Um, hello, everyone. I want to thank Emily Johnson, gallery manager and curator of this exhibition for organizing the event and inviting my fellow faculty members um, to the panel discussion. I spent a large part of my life collecting and studying fossils from the United States with particular focus on shark's teeth. I'm probably no different than most of my students, which I made come to the event today. Um, <laughs> I grew up in suburban northern New Jersey, and um, I was lucky enough to spend my summers at the Jersey Shore fishing, clamming, and beach going. In 1975, um, I was nine years old when the uh, movie Jaws came out, and um, I immediately became fascinated with um, sharks. Today, many years later, I've collected fossil shark teeth that date back to the age of the dinosaurs from multiple states. These shark's teeth provide an outstanding record for a teaching tool, obviously, in my classroom, but also of sea level change, global ice balance, plate tectonism, and of course, evolution. My shark tooth record is over 100 million years old. I have some in front uh, that I've brought up here as kind of a prop if you'd like to come up after um, the discussion to talk about them. Um, they come from South Dakota, New Jersey, and Alabama. I use geologic and scientific principles that are testable, reproducible, and predictable to find new shark tooth localities. That's the thrill of the chase for me. Um, 
The video I'm going to show is a small clip of a recent discovery in Alabama. I've been working with a group of environmentalists, um, some reporters and some cinematographers down there. Um, the fossil shark teeth in the video are between 35 and 40 million years old and were recovered in uh, a modern forest along a modern river. Um, the nearest shoreline to this area is about a three hour car ride and about 200 kilometers. So um, let's roll the video. Very, very rich um, deposit of, uh, of an ancient shoreline that uh, had quite a few sharks in. The creek that I'm sitting in right now is sawing away through the regional geology and it's unearthing layer after layer the history of the earth. So, the deeper we go in these individual layers, the further back in time that we're heading. More than half the state of Alabama at one time was submerged underneath an ancestral ocean that dates back to the age of the dinosaurs. And the record of that actually is recorded in the fossils and in the regional geology, like where we're sitting right now in this beautiful modern creek with waterfalls, and we're sitting around looking also at a forest, you know? So it's a really, really exciting way to go about reconstructing the history of sea level. And basically what we have here is a snapshot of about a 40 to 35 million year old fossil assemblage. So it really records a lot of exciting sea level change right here in the state of Alabama. So if modern sea level rise and change or fall operates on the order of centimeters per year, but when you project those centimeters per year over the enormous amount of time that we're talking about, you can get the types of sea level changes that we're looking at here. It's on its way up now and it's going to return to this area that we're sitting in. <laughs> and when it returns, so will the sharks. It's just going to be a while. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. Mm -hmm. And now we'll move on to Mick Griffith's presentation. So I guess I'll begin by saying that, as the exhibition suggests, traces of time, um, all three of us work in different frames of, of time from um, centuries to millions of years. And so I'm going to, we sort of started with, with Marty talking about millions of year time scales. I'm going to move into sort of 1,000 year and 100,000 100, year time scales and then um, Nikki's going to talk about sort of 100 year time scales. So um, just to begin, so this is a, a photograph of a cave I've been working in in Laos, Southeast Asia, the last five years. Um, fantastic cave. Um, and I guess the motivation for what I do is really stems from the fact that if we look at um, general circulation models that are sort of projecting future changes in climate going you know, to the end of the century, for example, um, if we look at, and, and this figure here just shows, the colours just represent the projection of change as we approach the end of this century. And if you just zoom into certain areas, so the areas of the, the figure here that aren't dotted basically signify where the different models don't agree. 
so they're sort of diverging. Um, I've just, this is just sort of a simulation of what a general circulation model sort of looks like if you look, if you were to break it down into all the maths and physics that goes into it. Um, so they you know, tend to attempt to simulate the real planet taking into account different processes and so forth. So the fact that there's some disagreement between the models uh, means that they aren't, the reason behind that is, is that they, there's not enough records from certain areas to be able to calibrate the models with. And so these sort of areas here where there's no dots, these are areas where there's lots of uncertainty um, because we just don't have that many records. And so part of the motivation about my work is going to these areas and collecting records so that we can get a better handle on what happened in the past so that we can improve our predictions in the future. Um, so really, the, I guess the scope of my work is really what's controlling regional hydrologic variability, so rainfall variability, on human time scales, but going back in time to, to periods when the Earth is sort of um, was, was different to today, but where we may approaching in terms of carbon dioxide concentrations and so forth. Um, and so because instrumental records only go back about 100 years, we really have to rely on the natural, what we call natural archives or proxies, climate proxies. And so we, um, some examples of those and what Dr. Darby's going to talk about with, with tree rings, so there's ice cores, marine sediment chemistry we can look at. And, and what I focus on is cave, cave records or speleothems in particular. So a speleothem is, is um, any sort of cave record that grows in a cave. And you can kind of think of them as fossilised groundwater. Okay, so what happens is water that, that rains above the cave, it moves through the soil. There's lots of CO2 in the soil because of all the plant activity, microbial activity. The, the water then becomes slightly acidic and then dissolves the limestone, which is calcium carbonate. And um, then what happens is it enters a cave, the water enters the cave, and because the CO2 concentration is so high, it must degas to be in, in to basically equilibrate with the cave atmosphere. And as it does that, it precipitates speleothems. Now the unique thing about these things is that what it's doing as it's precipitating that calcite, it's basically entrapping the signal directly above the cave. And so what we can do is we can, here's just a cross section of one of them, we can actually trace back in time the chemistry of these layers which tells us something about the rainfall above the cave, which is really, really unique. Um, really quick slide on this so that the primary thing we're looking at in the the calcite in the speleothem is what we call oxygen isotopes and if we were to look at just the so um, oxygen has two major isotopes um, and um, basically what happens is that as water circulates between phases from being evaporated from the ocean being uplifted condenses into a cloud that cloud moves inland and 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 the water falls out of the cloud. As water circulates in the hydrologic cycle, these two isotopes basically um, are discriminated. And so there's what we call fractionation. And that signal then is the, the signal that's recorded in the cave, we can sort of trace back and look back in time to, to what was going on in precipitation, convection, evaporation, ocean conditions and so forth. And so we're kind of just retracing the steps that the, that the air parcel has undergone to get to that cave record. So just to give you a quick summary of what, what the potential of these things is, this is a, uh, a really well-known record from China going back about 220,000 years. And these colours just represent the oxygen isotopes within each speleothem record. And I've got a a little, little sample up here if you want to come and look at it from one of my records that I've worked on. And um, basically it shows is that as the isotopes change in value, so x-axis is age, the y-axis is oxygen isotope values, as the values become more negative in this direction, the rainfall increased in China, in this part of China, and vice versa as they got higher, got drier. And what this, sh what this record demonstrated was that, in fact, if we go back through the ice ages, the, ones, the rainfall has actually gone up and down, up and down, in phase with this grey curve indicates Earth's rotation around the sun. And so that was, this was a really big finding um, back in 2008 and prior. So this is the kind of thing that I'm involved with, is actually reconstructing 
um, rainfall going back many hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so one cave I'm working in, or a couple of caves um, in Southeast Asia in, in Laos, that I've been working there for about five years now. Um, one cave in Tom Mai up here, and also in the central part of, the, of Laos. Um, the, in the northern region, it's very remote. You have to go, it takes you two hours to get there by boat. There's no electricity or anything. Um, you, li you basically stay in this little village here and you visit the cave every day. Um, this is kind of what it looks like as, you, as you're going up, up the river. It's just a beautiful um, spot. And this is the cave entrance. And so you, mm -hmm. they, these mountains are just riddled with these small, these caves that are just, you have to squeeze into. And you get into them and they are kilometres long. Um, just to give you an example of actually collecting these things, you have to abseil in and there's, you know, 100 foot pitches and so forth. So actually getting them out can be quite a challenge, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and then, so when we go to these sites, we, we're doing a whole bunch of things. In addition to collecting the records, we, we sampled the soil, soil CO2, um, uh, moisture content, so forth. We collect drip waters. Um, to measure the, the isotopes and chemistry of the water. We, we um, put in plates that we collect calcite throughout the year that we then collect every year we go back. And we're also measuring just the air itself, so the, the um, chemistry of the air. Um, on the last trip I went on, which was last year, um, we, we moved down to the central part of the country and we found some other, we were working with a, a French caving group um, and actually one of the caves we're working in is the third largest cave in, in Southeast Asia and the largest in Laos. It's about 40 kilometres of passage so far. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the sections of the cave you have to go in there by water and so forth. So um, just amazing places. Um, and I thought I'd just finish up with showing this little clip. So this is a little clip that one of the cavers put together on the last trip, kind of summarising. It's all in French, so you won't understand, well, unless you speak French, what's, um, what they're talking about. Um, so they're called Explo Laos, the, the caving group we go with. Au cœur de la jungle laotienne, les explorateurs du dernier espace vierge de notre planète. That was very interesting. Um, and next we'll go on to Nicole Davi's work. Okay, oh, all right, thank you. It's so nice to be here. I like that video a lot. I'd like one of those uh, of my field work with a soundtrack like that. Um, so I'll just start by saying I really like science art collaborations. I think they can be very powerful and um, I see more and more of it happening and I find it really exciting because you may know that science often has a difficult time communicating to a larger audience and I think art can really support that. So for example, just looking around this room, I relate very strongly to two of the artists presented here. So 
if you look at Rachel Sussman's work up there, um, she's focusing on the oldest living things in the world. And for them to get that way, um, what you can notice is they're all growing in very harsh conditions. So they're growing very slowly. And I am, as a scientist, drawn to places like that for the same reason, um, because they are these really sensitive um, things that grow slowly and can tell me something about the environment. So she has some trees up there, which um, I also study, just in a different way. And then if you look at uh, Christina Seely's work over here, she focuses on the Arctic. And for me, this picture, I could put up a tent and camp out there for a month and do a lot of research. This is a field site. This would be a perfect field site for me. Um, so I, I study tree rings, and um, you can see a receding glacier in there. And she's interested in capturing a story of a place that's changing. Um, and I actually am too. We just have different target audiences, and we tell stories in different ways. Um, so I would go to this place and I would collect a lot of data. So a lot of interesting stuff for me there. And the Arctic's amazing because it's a very sensitive place. Our, our climate is changing and it is hitting the Arctic um, pretty significantly. So these are very sensitive areas to climate change. <clears throat> okay, so this is um, one of Rachel Sussman's pictures of, these are bristlecone pine. These are the oldest uh, trees in the world. They can grow to about, they can live to about 5,000 years. And like I said, for them to do that, they have to grow really slow. Um, it's very harsh conditions. So what I, what I do is I would take tree ring samples um, from something like this. And you can see variation in the tree rings. You can see there's a lot of variability in the width of those rings. Yes, you can see that? Yeah. Okay, so that's, um, that's giving me a lot of information about what the environment was like that that tree grew in, right? So they're, we're not in, they're not invasive. We don't hurt the tree. We use a hand drill. It's about the size of a pencil. Okay, so uh, those bristlecone pines are growing in California. So just to put it into perspective for you, I'm sure you're all aware of the droughts that hit California over the past couple years. It was in the news quite a bit. Everybody's very concerned about it. Um, so I'm a paleoclimatologist, as is Mick. We have a lot of overlap in the stuff that we, we talk about. But what I wanna know is, and what tree rings can tell me, is how often have droughts of this magnitude happened in the past, and how long, how long can they last, right? So. Um, it's funny, we always put up a lot of data. This, this is what's very inspiring to us, is looking at these curves and trying to understand what's going on, what, what is driving the trends that you see in this data set. Um, and I don't have a pointer, but if you, if, you bring, if you look around 1600, you can see that curve going down. And what's that showing you is that there was a, a drought um, for two decades in California. So, and then back to 1300, there's almost a, a 30 year drought that happened. And we, we can see this in tree rings. And actually, we have tree ring records that go back quite a bit further. And they can show us that, you know, drought in California, yeah, it can last for three years. But tree ring records can show us that they can last for 30 years, which is really a whole different thing to think about if you're managing water resources and thinking about water resources for millions of people. So um, now I'm gonna just bring you to Central Asia. Uh, I do a lot of work in Mongolia, <coughs> excuse me, and I like this picture a lot because it gives you a sense of what life is like in Mongolia and that uh, these nomadic herders um, really live off the land. They're quite vulnerable. And this is also what I like about photography is that you can in an instant get a sense of um, people and how vulnerable they can be. Um, so that you don't see any trees, but there actually are a lot of trees in Mongolia. Um, so, um, yeah, you can get a sense that uh, if there is a blizzard or a drought, that they're quite vulnerable to those conditions. They're nomadic herders, and they have large um, flocks of sheep and yak and goats. 
which they're quite dependent on. Um, and our understanding of climate variability largely comes from data that we've recorded. This is uh, just showing you a meteorolog meteorological station. Um, the problem with these records, they're wonderful that we have them, it's just that they're quite short, um, maybe 50 years or 100 years at best. Um, actually, Central Park, we have about a 200-year record, which is typically we don't have that much of an understanding of climate. But in Mongolia, um, these are just showing you these blue dots are um, meteorological stations. So what I, what I want you to just notice is that if you look up in the top left from 1850 to 1900, there's no data. There's no meteorological stations. And then as you move forward in time up to 1930, there's still no meteorological stations. And then 1950, there's uh, less than 10. And then in 1990, there's 37. So it's just a very short um, window that we're getting to see how climate has changed through time. Um, and tree ring records can add uh, a tremendous amount of time. They can add a tremendous amount of context to our understanding of variability. So if you actually look at what those records are showing us, this is from 1900 to the year uh, 2000. And I, I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see, but this is showing you precipitation. And what I want you to notice is at the end, it's just dropping off to a drought. Can you see how it's, the data is dropping off there? So this area went uh, through a very large drought. And what, what happened is the uh, pastures dry out and they lose a lot of their animals. So it's, um, it, it can have huge impacts on people that live there. So this is a picture that I would think Rachel Sussman might like. This is uh, one of our, this is probably a thousand year old tree growing in the middle of a lava field in um, Mongolia. And it looks all gnarly and twisty. It's growing super, super slow. And we would take cores of that to try and understand how often uh, droughts happen over a thousand year time period. This is a, 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 a more of a bird's eye view of this site. But that's an old lava flow. And just for scale, you can see a person standing next to that tree. So they're, they're bigger than they look in the picture, but for a 700-year-old tree, it's still pretty small. And you can see the ring variability, um, which tells us a lot of information about drought. So we go all over. Um, all over the country, those red dots are just showing you our sites. So we have probably about 50 different sites across the country. And um, what I, all I want you to notice here, um, so the, the red line is showing you the tree ring record, and the black line is showing you um, moisture variability based on recorded data. And what you should, the, what you should notice here is uh, that they're very strongly correlated, right? They, they track very well. Um, so it's a very strong relationship. And based on that relationship, we can build our records backwards. So this is just, um, okay, don't mind that. Uh, this is looking at drought over 400 years. And again, I showed you that the past uh, 10 years or so are in a drought. Just those blue dots are showing you recorded data, and then all the way back to 1600 is based on tree rings. And just look at how much variability is there, right? There's, there's a two-decade drought in that. So in the recorded data, we haven't seen a two-decade drought. But what tree rings and paleoclimate records can show us is that it's possible and that it's within the range of natural variability. Um, just another thing to think about. So I think a lot about Mongolia. But um, they're, they're undergoing rapid development. And they have very, it's a very arid region. They have very little, very, um, I think they only get about four inches of rain a year, where we get something like 44 here. So they're very dry. But they're, there's mining, they're, they're doing a lot of building, um, a lot of irrigation. So when you have a place that can naturally go into drought for two decades, you have to think about your water resources. And I'll just leave you with this picture. This is um, for uh, myself. I've been working there for more than a decade, and my colleagues have been there even longer. And of all the pictures we have, this is my favorite of the site, just because I think it communicates 
Um, like here's this nomadic herder in the middle of this harsh environment and you can get a sense of the vulnerability and, and the toughness of the people that live there. Uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all three panelists. Um, I want to, thank you. Before we move on to the discussion part of the event, I want to open the floor to questions you might have pertaining directly to their presentations. Um, I just ask that you raise your hand. If you do have questions, I'll have to deliver the mic to you myself. Um, does anybody have questions or comments? Dr. Han? One moment, please. If you could speak into the mic. I think this is sort of for Nikki. Um, in terms of the de definition of living things, since these things are growing so slowly, and uh, how do you determine that they're not uh, becoming fossilized, that they're still alive, that they're, are they reproducing, et cetera? So for trees, yes, um, they have to grow, a ring. if they're not growing a ring, I mean, they're dead. So, um, <clears throat> so sometimes, like if you look at my very first slide, it's actually Rachel's, the bristlecone pine, half that tree is dead. You can see actually so much of that tree is dead, but part of it is still, still going, and it's still growing rings. So they're actually, they're just really remarkable in um, how they've survived for so long and growing so slowly. But just another thing to point out is that in places where the conditions are so harsh, a tree can fall over, um, and it won't rot because uh, it's a harsh environment, and it can sit out there for a thousand years. Um, so then that we can come and take samples of it, and we can connect these living and dead samples. And we do call those subfossilized. They're not actually fossilized. It would take much more time. Marty could tell you about that, but, um, but we call them that. But then we can connect these living and dead records and make records that go back 2,000 years or so. This, uh, yeah. What's the mechanics of getting a sample? Oh, for me? Yeah. What's oh, the mechanics uh, of getting a sample of the rings? So, I should have brought it with me. There's a very small hand drill. It costs about 200 bucks, and uh, you just crank it into a tree, and you pull out a sample. It's about the size of a pencil. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't actually cut down trees unless they're already uh, like those sub-fossil samples I was explaining. We would chainsaw those if we have permission, right? Uh, I have a question for Dr. Becker. So I recall when reading an article about your research in Alabama with the shark teeth that Charles Lyell, uh, one of the fathers of geology, so to speak, um, and deep time as well, uh, had done research there many, many years ago. Uh, was that one of the reasons you chose that spot? Um, actually, what happened was the reporter that we were working with um, was interested in how people from New Jersey would use the same principles that Charles Lyell uh, from England at the time would come to a place they'd never been and look at the geology and interpret what was going on, how we would interpret the age of the earth, how fossils would occur. So Lyell came to Alabama to use geologic principles that were developed by William Strata Smith in England to look for coal. And interestingly enough, they thought that the units that they were looking at in Alabama were equivalent in age to those in England. And as it turned out, Lyell was able to point out to them that they were geologically much younger. But the beauty of the argument is, is that geologic principle applies whether you're in England, Alabama, New Jersey, or planet Earth. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? No? We'll move on to the discussion portion. Um, if any of you have been here before for our Dare to Pair event series, you would know that we often put together um, two groups of people or two speakers who have um, unrelated topics, so to speak. Uh, but we try and find the commonalities um, in them both. 
um, and we are opening up discussions to do so. Um, so I'm going to start with a series of questions for the panelists, because uh, each of the artists in this show were inspired by scientific research, uh, do the fieldwork expeditions along with scientists and the like. Um, so I think some of the questions that I'll ask not only pertain to the artists, but also to the panelists' work. Uh, I'd first like to address the ideas of Im imagination and the scientific spirit. Uh, scientific exploration and creativity serves as the foundation for each of the photographers' work in this show. Um, Caleb Charlin explains that for him, each piece begins as a question of visual possibilities and develops in tandem with the natural laws of the world. Rachel Sussman's been inspired by a quote from theoretical physicist and mathematician Freeman Dyson saying, all of science is uncertain and subject to revision. The glory of science is to imagine more than we can prove. She claims that it is her role as an artist to answer some questions, but to ask many more. So for the panelists, I would like to know, could you please tell us uh, what has inspired your current field of study or research topics, and what in particular sparked your interest? Sure. Um, I, I grew up um, at the Jersey Shore, and um, my father gave me an option when I was 13 years old. Um, it was either to go to summer school or find jobs. So my brother Joe and I and our friend Jeff formed JJM Clams, Joe, Jeff, and Marty Clams. We were bay clammers, and we bought a boat, and we ran around in the bays and sold clams during the summertime. And um, I have so many fond memories of that. I wouldn't take it back for a second. And the love of sharks and fish and water and all the things that I do now began there. So. Um, one thing I like to point out is that um, what's so nice about being a scientist is you can get inspiration from so many things. So um, our whole project in Mongolia was inspired by one of our scientists reading an article in the Wall Street Journal about the economy of Mongolia. And there was a picture of Mongolia, the steppe, and maybe a person on a horse but she could see in the background a mountain full of trees. And she thought, gosh, who's done tree ring work in Mongolia? Has anybody? Um, and she just started looking into it and asking questions. And then she wrote a proposal which got funded um, and started this huge push into paleoclimate in the center, center of Asia. Um, but it was all just this serendipitous, she read this article in the Wall Street Journal that wasn't about climate or anything, but she saw a picture of trees. So I just, I love that science can be so inspired and you follow just something that interests you, right? And now, now we have this massive project. I guess I can, um, as you can tell from the accent, I'm not from New Jersey. I'm from um, a small town actually on the southeast coast of Australia, uh, 2,000 people. Um, uh, 50 kilometres north and south of me was just national parks. And so I you know, just had appreciation for the environment, the oceans and so forth because that was my backyard. I grew up surfing, fishing, all water sports. And so I just, you know, I always loved science at school and then I, I did, uh, did a, um, a year exchange um, in the States and kind of, as Nikki was describing, a lot of serendipity involved because it, you know, yeah, I just was always interested in science and, and you know, the weather and, and things like that, which kind of got me interested in studying climate and, and past climate. Um, and so I think, yeah, at a personal level, it's sort of, there's a lot of overlap between what I study and, and what I'm just passionate about. And then in terms of creativity, um, yeah, well, you know, scientists were always asking questions. That's the whole point, is to un have a better understanding of the Earth. And, um, and science is one of those things that, you know, you take two steps forward, one step back, and, and science sort of just keeps moving forward, but you're always trying to come up with new ways of, of, of answering new questions. And so um, there's a very crea creative aspect of it. Thank you for your input. I find that fascinating. I can actually um, 
tell that it relates quite a bit to Caleb's experience. I know he grew up in rural Maine and was doing a lot of um, outdoor research and that kind of thing, prompting his own experiments. And so it sounds like there's some similarities there. Um, Mick uh, addressed the creativity bit, but I'm wondering if either Nikki or uh, Marty have any other um, things they'd like to add about how creativity or imagination plays in the work that you do? Um, well, in terms of the creativity and imagination elements, um, part of the offshoot of the commercial climbing I described to you, um, I have an opportunity to hang out with a circle of commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen. And um, one of the exciting things is um, I get to actually go and catch modern sharks, some of which um, we eat. Um, but I use the modern sharks um, that swim in our oceans right off the Jersey Shore as analogies to um, study um, the fossil past. Um, we've been tracking a particular shark um, on my iPhone named Mary Lee. Um, she swims between Chatham, Massachusetts and my house in Big Pine Key in Florida. And I'm happy to say I have not seen her while I've been out on the water. <laughs> this is a 3,500 pound great white shark. So a lot of the creativity and exploration um, in my hobbies and the things I like to do on my weekends and free time roll over very nicely into my world of research. Marty has a really interesting uh, office space and I was <laughs> permitted to see the shark heads in his freezer so I, I kind of understand the backstory to some of the research he's doing. <laughs> They've um, recently been dissected with um, some of our biology students that are um, training to become dentists. <laughs> it's a teeth to work with. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, I'm going to move. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, um, well, I'm obsessed with Mary Lee. So is everyone in my family. But um, just in terms of creativity, I don't think people always realize how creative science can be. Uh, we are often um, driven by funding. We're always trying to get funding to do research, which means we write proposals. And it's actually very exciting to write a proposal because you're just pitching your best ideas. Um, and you're trying to be creative. You need to distinguish yourself. It's very difficult to get funded. But it's always, you know, starting a proposal is very exciting because it's, it's ideas. You're asking for a lot of money, um, a lot of cash for your best ideas. So it's it's challenging, but it's, it's really fun. And that's, I do think, you know, one of your most creative times. That's interesting. I know the artists here can relate to having to pitch proposals to get funding for their projects. Um, a lot of times artists, uh, to advance their careers, have to attend artist residency programs, uh, some of which are paid for, some of which are not. And they have to be able to take the time away from work to go attend these uh, to further their artistic career. Um, it'd be interesting then to see more um, artists and scientists collaborations in these proposals. Uh, there are a number of residency programs that exist that uh, focus on artists that are specifically working with scientists or scientific research. Um, and that was actually how I discovered a lot of the artists in this show was by uh, tracking their residence involvements. Um, moving on to the photographic process, scientific method, and experimentation. Uh, these photographers began their work with the desire to explore, to discover, and to understand, um, and then to communicate their findings visually. In this way, their process seems similar to the scientific method. Uh, they use the medium of photography to capture that which we might not otherwise see, to make real and tangible the things that elude us. And they're continually testing its capabilities, recording their results, as well as rethinking and refining their efforts to achieve this. Caleb acknowledges that the way we understand the world relies so much on our ability to measure it. And Sharon Harper's photographs are the results of technical, exacting, and methodo I'm sorry, methodical experiments. Each image is a test that explores the relationship between the viewer, the artist, optical devices, and the thing that's being depicted. I've mentioned ways in which the artists have employed the scientific method and experimentation within their work. I'm interested to know how art and visual representation um, has served your research projects. Um, 
Okay, I guess, um, so when you're, when you're writing a paper for a journal, um, and you know, this is a skill, like I've become skilled now in Adobe Illustrator, just due to the fact that um, when I create, when I have some, some data and I want to portray it to the, to the readers, um, you know, you have to have some artistic, if you, especially if you want to get into a really good journal, you know, you have to be able to convey that data in some readable fashion. And so I think with um, the artistic side of things, I've become really, um, I've become pretty good at just uh, making things look pretty in terms of in terms of data that may otherwise just seem like a in an Excel spreadsheet, just two columns of data, um, making it look. Um, I don't know. You, you probably have the same. It's about communicating it and translating. Yeah, it's about uh, translating the data through an artistic vision too, I suppose. Yeah. Nicole, I'll come to you in a moment, but uh, Marty, I know you've uh, stressed the importance of um, collaborating with art students to render some of the fossils that you have. Can you explain a little more how that's useful? Well, certainly along the lines of Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop, um, very powerful programs um, for my research. Um, when you publish on fossils, you have to reposit them in a museum and the fossils are given a catalog number so that everyone has access to the fossils, whether they're capable of doing the type of field work that I am or not, they can go and confirm my identification and interpretation of the fossil by going to that reposited fossil in the museum. So anything that I publish on has to have a catalog number and it's for all to utilize. The other thing along the idea of um, the art and interpretation. I spend many hours, um, if I'm going to go to a new locality, um, I've worked in Utah, South Dakota, as I was saying, um, Arkansas has been really good to me, Alabama, and, and remember I grew up in northern New Jersey my whole life. I went to graduate school in Brooklyn. Um, I spend many hours looking at Google Earth, <laughs> zooming in and out and looking for particular locations where geologic process may allow me access to the stratigraphic units that contain the fossils that I'm after. Also, um, topographic maps are another invaluable tool, so um, they have that photographic and artistic component effect. I think also with field geology, right? I mean, if, if you're a good artist and you can go into the field and draw a, draw a sketch of a deposit or a stratigraphic unit or something, I mean, if you have skills with, with drawing you know it's a lot easier to read and, and interpret when you get back to the office because <laughs> now I mean, nowadays you just take photos but it's sure. still nice to have um, drawings of it so Nikki, do you want to oh, so uh, one thing I was thinking about is um, if you can visual visualize the um, sometimes it's called the hockey stick curve or the um, if you think about global climate change there's a curve right that's pretty pretty well known I think certainly in my circles, but if you can think about global warming and that curve that you see maybe on the news or something. But if you think about that curve, there are like years, decades, thousands of hours, thousands of expeditions, millions and millions of dollars that go into that curve. Um, so thinking about that, I started to put together a photo archive of um, all the expeditions that the tree ring lab that I'm involved with has done over the past 30 years. Because in, you can't imagine in, in one scientific curve how much effort and money has gone into creating it. So I feel like having, um, you know, right now my archive has a thousand photos and it's just scientists doing science all over the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but maybe that, those images can tell that story of that enormous scientific push that went into making that curve because nobody, you, don't, you just can't realize it when you're looking at just some data on a graph. You, know? you just can't get the sense of the work that goes into it. <laughs> and imagery uh, can, can help tell that story. And just one other point is I often have, uh, been lucky enough to work with artists and theater artists and it's almost like an experiment to me because I like to see what artists focus in on and if it's different what, than what scientists focus in on. So I can tell them about my research 
and then to see how they absorb that and communicate it is fascinating because very often we focus on different things, which is, which is interesting. Yeah. Rachel Sussman has uh, provided a TED talk before, and I encourage you to look that up online. It's actually really interesting. But she goes into um, great detail about how she got started with the Oldest Living Things in the World project. Um, and when she was first looking for scientists to partner with and to continue the project, um, there wasn't any one particular kind of science that studied the longevity of multiple species um, in terms of longevity across multiple um, areas of research and that. Um, and so by presenting this project, creating this visual archive, she's actually uh, created a time capsule that now scientists are using for their own personal research. Yeah, so the same with this archive that I put together. It's showing you a, a place at a certain amount of time, right? So people would use this photograph uh, with a glacier. Have you, you, you may have seen glacier, pictures of glaciers through time, so you can see them receding. So it really is a scientific data point. Yeah. Right. And there's a, um, I know there's a, a group, Project Pressure, have you heard of that, that are tracking um, glacial changes over time using repeat photography, but rather than having a few select um, individuals doing this, they're encouraging it to be uh, community sourced. And so you can actually uh, check out the website, and if you're planning to go anywhere near a glacier, um, you geotag your imagery and they can use it then for scientific study. Had I known that, I would have done it myself in Svalbard, but I didn't know that at the time. Heidi, you have a question? I also want to encourage you all, if you have questions, um, I'm happy to bring this over to you. Thank you. Um, I, this, uh, this exhibition has been very interesting to me. Um, I work closely with the galleries, and so while Emily's kind of been going through the thought process for setting it all up, and then talking about her meetings with the three of you, it's, it's just kind of gotten me thinking about sort of the interconnectedness of science and the arts and the humanities. And yesterday I was listening to NPR on my way somewhere and they had um, someone talking about how the emphasis that we have at the moment in so much of the academic world on STEM is affecting the humanities in a negative way in that there's so much funding for the STEM fields um, comparatively to humanities. And it, it, he was, the, the person who was speaking on the radio was saying that this is a real problem because you can be very, very gifted and work very, very hard in STEM, but if you're not able to communicate your ideas effectively, you end up not achieving what you otherwise could. And I think applying that to, be, to the arts and to the fact that you are you know, professors working with students, I'd be interested in hearing if you have any thoughts on how you know or how you might encourage your students, your science students, to perhaps take arts classes or art students to come take science classes and how you would envision that playing out. Great question. Go ahead, Marty. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I absolutely agree with um, what you're saying, um, and I had no idea in my wildest imagination that I would be a, a minor movie star on or whatever you would like to call it. Um, I've never taken a course in public speaking, although I've been teaching for 26 years. I've never taken a course, a formal course in art and um, in acting. Um, the types of things now, um, that video that you saw was cut and chopped and pasted together because you know there was a lot of takes because we were you know fooling around and having fun with the process and everything but um i, I wish i'd had more uh in that in my early training for sure um so and in general um i find that scientists have a real difficult time in, in getting their message across to the rest of the world so um absolutely i agree I think that's that's certainly a, an important push. I think, given um, just how much, in terms of just environmental issues, global warming, etc., how much noise and uncertainty there is just amongst the general audience because of, um, I think, for one, for, for one matter, of, it's just the fact that scientists 
yeah, haven't been that, that great at conveying the, um, the work to the general public. And so trying to, um, to, to improve on that, maybe through, um, through yeah, art students and so forth. Um. Just, uh, just to follow up on that, I don't think scientists are usually trying to communicate with the public. You know, they write their papers and do their research for other scientists. So there's uh, some scientists who are remarkably gifted at communicating with the public, and they should be in front of the public more often, and others that shouldn't. <laughs> but um, I'm sure you've all seen them. Like Neil deGrasse Tyson, I mean, he's a superstar. He's amazing what he does for science. He, uh, the astrophysicist who works at the Museum of Natural History. <clears throat> but just to touch on uh, STEM and the humanities, getting funded in STEM is, is tough for sure, but comparatively to humanities, we have a much bigger pot to draw from. <clears throat> but the good news, over the past uh, five years or so, maybe more, um, National Science Foundation and lots of funding agencies, there is a big push for interdisciplinary research. So they want our research, climate research, um, geoscience research, they want it connected to people. They want it connected to, you know, we struggle sometimes to find social scientists that we can work with and then put a proposal together that's cohesive and makes sense because we speak different languages. But that, there's a big push for that. And the funding agents, if it comes from the funding agencies, it's eventually going to move more in that direction. And my, um, my classes are doing a collaborative project with the gallery later this semester. And they're actually very excited about it. But it will take them out of their comfort zone a little bit, yeah, which is good. Yeah, I took a chemistry class in college. And I was an art history major. Sorry, I took a chemistry class in college. I was thinking about going into art conservation, and I took that chemistry class, and man, it pushed me out of my comfort zone. But I have never regretted it. It was fantastic. So uh, thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful to hear you talk and hear you talk about your disciplines. I always feel uh, you know, enlarged mentally to be able to, to experience this. And so much comes to mind, you know? I mean, not, notwithstanding this fabulous exhibition and all these artists who've already trying to bring science into their work. And um, you know, of course, it, you'd be remiss without talking a little bit about the history of why we were cleaved apart. By we, I mean scientists and artists. It starts with Leonardo, you know, and I read a wonderful essay about how the Leonardo notebooks, the codexes, which are extraordinary documents of both science and art, of human culture in general, uh, you know, were hidden in, the, in his uh, attic for a little while, and then somebody else found them, and they started ripping pages out. So, you know, people that wanted to buy the art things got the art things, and the people who were more interested in science got the science things, and that might have been this moment where there was a split in our two, you know, I, I look at you in the river with a box of mud on top of you and uh, pulling out tiny little shark's teeth, I think looks like an artist to me, that's what we do. We're, we're in the mud, we're doing these things and doing all this stuff. But, you know, also a famous essay was written uh, by C.P. Snow called Two Cultures. It was in the 50s and he was a British, I think a chemist and also, I tried to check in on Wikipedia really quickly before, a chemist and a novelist, right? And he talked about the ignorance of one discipline to another, you know, almost like the left hand and the right hand, not knowing what each, each other's doing. And I think, you know, what's wonderful about science is that you, you, the definition you gave in the beginning about repeatability and predictability and all these kinds of things, I'm not sure such a definition exists for art or the humanity. I'm, I'm gonna say art because you know, that's my field. Uh, I'm not sure such a definition, such a firm thing can be reached back to and referred to. And in fact, but, but also I do feel in this contemporary moment, we have a critical, you know, there's a real influence of critical theory and the critical ideas so that artists are really very concerned with their relationship with power and very concerned with how to express those relationships, reveal them, et cetera. And oftentimes science people, uh, science artists, I should say, are trying to examine that and reveal it as well. Um, you know, names are, you know, as I get older, names are not coming as quickly. Um, but uh, the guy that looks like, eh, never mind, doesn't matter who it is. I'll come, I'll come up with it later. Um, so the thing is, is that what I want to say is that self-criticality and the criticality of the relationship of the artist to culture is an extremely important feature of what artists do, to challenge power or to think about power and think about its machination and to be critical about it. I wonder if you guys have that, even though your definition is so good and so clear, 
I wonder if you also have that sense of criticality about your profession or about your, your, your project, so. I'll go for it. Um, I, in the classes that I teach, and in my definition of science, um, I try and distinguish between belief-based systems and scientific systems because um, just a poll of this audience, we probably all believe something very, very different about heaven, perhaps. So uh, the connection between art and the age of the earth um, has been controversial since the pages of the books that you were describing were torn out. But in my course that I'm teaching right now in Earth Through Time, I try and show factual evidence that's testable, predictable, and reproducible to the students independent of what we believe in. And um, art that connects the true age of the Earth, um, if you rewind the hands of time, would have been a, a, a risky proposition. Um, but we are in 2016. Criticalness in, of my own work. So, I see the discipline as a pit of vipers. <laughs> I, I just, they are, we are trained to see where people are making assumptions, to find weaknesses. Nobody's more familiar with the weaknesses in my work than myself, but, um, and it, it's not um, personal. It, this is just how we work. So it's actually fascinating to um, see a group of scientists together and just how, well, why did you, you know, make this assumption and did you think about this? And it, it's, it's a, it can be a harsh community. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, and it, it also depends on your, your fields too. I mean, so, um, you know, me and Nikki are sort of, you know, we're paleoclimatologists, but we use different proxies, and so we can sometimes be like, no, tree rings, they, they're wrong. Spilithems are the one, you know, <laughs> they're the ones that work the best. And, and also, just um, touching on, on being critical, you know, so as an as a academic, you know, we review journal articles, proposals all the time. And so, uh, yeah, the job of that is to be critical of that scientific research because that, that paper is eventually, well, if it's good enough, it'll go through to the, to the journal. But if it's not, then we have to reject it because otherwise that doesn't advance science. If there's some issues with it, then we have to be sort of stamp that out and make, make sure that the, the scientists correct for that. And if they can't, then it's not worthy of publication. And that's how you separate the science from a blog or a, you know, some other form of media. Just to follow up on that, I mean, that critical feedback, I mean, uh, we thrive off that, you know? I'm totally open to that. I, be as critical as you can. It will only strengthen my science, so. And it hurts to begin with. Like, it really hurts when you get a review back from a paper and you've spent years on it and, and you're reading these reviews, but then, you know, after you sleep on it, a week goes by, like, okay, yep, now I get it. <laughs> and very, so, yeah, yeah, right, very often they're accurate. Sometimes yeah. they're off the wall, but yeah. most, most of the time it's good feedback. Yeah. The um, fossil shark tooth community is no different. <laughs> they're a rough bunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> For a paragraph in a short time, you know, and uh, but I I would think other examples of that kind of thing that I that I would reference from my point of view as an artist looking at people that have worked with science and stuff would be somebody like Bruno Latour, or even uh, Paul Feyerabend. You know, you might may or may not know, but you know, Paul Feyerabend wrote the book Against Method and talked a lot about the scientific method. And you know, I, I understand your point of view. You know. How do you argue against people that believe the wor world is 6,000 years old you know, and, and don't accept the idea of repeatability and research and verifiability and all, don't, don't even accept it, just reject it. So I get that, I get that. But, um, but I'm also talking about you know, these other people, uh, eh, you know, maybe it's good enough to leave it, but the point is, is that there are these guys that chop away at this concept 
that science has some problems. And you guys, it's interesting, you went to the how people criticize one another because it's so overwhelming in your discipline. And by the way, part of that wonderful process of argument and you know, so on. But I'm kind of interested in how you might criticize the discipline itself. What are the weaknesses of the scientific method? Are there any weaknesses of the scientific method? It's a form of representation. And, that, and representation always reflects something about power, you know? And so, you know, uh, today we see this person, not that person, you know, that would be an example. So, you know, it's a big discussion, but I just thought it'd be fun to, fun to bring it up. Yeah. Um, just one quick add-on. I teach um, a lot of non-science majors, and we hike to the top of High Mountain, and I've been finding fossil corals there. And I ask an audience that doesn't come from a scientific background, please explain this for me. I don't see any travel brochures that say, come snorkel the beautiful coral reefs of High Mountain behind William Patterson University. And, and there begins the discussion. And it comes from all points of view. Um, I had a question for Dr. Davi, actually. Uh, while I was doing a little research for the, for the panel and on this exhibit, uh, I noticed that you actually were featured in a book about trees with Rachel Sussman. And I was interested in hearing a little bit about that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was really exciting. Um, that came out, uh, I think, just uh, in the fall. So, um, forgetting the name of the artist uh, that I was working with, uh, who put the whole book together. She's a visual artist, she does sculpture, um, and she's always been interested in tree rings. Um, Katie, Holton. Katie Holton, thank you. So she, she often does sculpture of trees, and she likes the idea of um, trees as clocks, so she wanted to do some sculpture on that. So I was put in touch with her actually through a group called Positive Feedback that connects um, scientists with artists. So I actually went to a speed dating workshop where you're not actually dating, but um, every two minutes, a scientist and artist sit down and just brainstorm ideas, and then two minutes you are sitting with a new artist. Um, and Katie Holton was one of the people that I was connected with, and it's actually pretty amazing in that, um, in that atmosphere how much ideas can fly. When you have people who are used to building ideas and building projects and working collaboratively, and actually this, this is the same for Mick and I when we are in the same uh, lab space, and he, he might throw out an idea and we can we can build a proposal in about 10 minutes so we can get really excited about an idea but this is uh, how I got connected with her and she asked me to contribute and she asked me to represent science for the book so it was the tall order but I was uh, the scientist of the book and some other big big names on there so it was it was uh, really nice to be part of and a successful project at that we couldn't obtain a copy it's completely sold out Hopefully there will be more room. I think there is one in the library. I think the library ordered one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Um, we just have a few minutes left, so I want to make sure you guys get some time to ask a few more questions if you'd like. Um, but I kind of wanted to flip to um, influencing perceptions, uh, the future, what's next in your studies. Uh, Christina Seely here studies the ever-changing relationship with natural systems of time. Her works on view in this exhibition address the impact of climate change on cycles and rhythms in various ecosystems. And she explains that by tying the viewer as individual to the global, her work generates a dialogue about the growing uncertainty of the future relationship with the planet. Um, and then for Rachel, she says, these works are a record and celebration of the past, a call to action in the present, and a barometer of our future. My question is this, what do you feel is the biggest challenge in motivating people to take global climate change issues seriously? And how could non-science majors or artists get involved in raising awareness for these issues? From a scientific perspective. One of the things um, I discuss, I teach a class in meteorology, general geology, and earth through time here, is um, some of the students will bring up the idea that they um, don't believe in global warming. Um, and that is a very 
controversial and long discussion to take place. But I think it's important for those students to be exposed to the scientific facts behind what goes into interpreting global warming and global climate change because it has um, a political and economic connection to the next generation of informed citizens that are voting right now for what the future is of this country as well as our role in the world right now as a country in something as current as the next presidential election, which I'm sure you're all watching. So, I think, <clears throat> I think it's especially difficult these days because there's just so much media out there with social media and so forth. I mean, you just, you just have to go to Facebook and you can scroll down your newsfeed and find someone who <laughs> commented on some article that that is against the science of global warming, you know. So it's it's, it's very difficult, I think. But um, yeah, I think it's just education um, and just trying to work with with communities into explaining, you know, what goes into actually creating the data that sort of verifies the science and. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, it's, it's a tough one. Um. That is a very tough question. Uh, just one of the things for me that I think about is um, how easy it is for the, the sci scientific understanding, which is extensive, <coughs> to get monkey-wrenched by, say, a news organization or a politician who just um, can cast doubt uh, about the process of the science or the motivation of the scientists. Um, and I wonder why it's so easy to monkey wrench this enormous amount of research um, with just a tiny, li just a little tool, it seems like. And I, I think it's just um, that this science is a community and it's a process, and I think it's not fully understood. Um, and that is part of the reason why it's so easy for the scientific knowledge to get um, misunderstood, because there's been a lot of that. And especially with, with this field, given that it's so politicized, mm -hmm. that people who, who lean one way or the other politically just associate that view with the science when ideally they're just totally separate. For example, if you, if you if you were um, Republican, you didn't like Al Gore, then automatically you don't believe in global warming. You know, so we find that a lot. And so trying to break those barriers is, um, is a challenge. But How would you explain a, a, a fossil shark's tooth in the middle of South Dakota if the sea level has not changed, if the climate on planet Earth hasn't changed? Um, so for me, um, it becomes really a, a pretty concrete argument, you know, if you ask somebody about a belief system versus, hey, take a look right here, explain that. And when I ask the ranchers who I ask for permission to go on their land, hey, do you mind if I have a look here? I think there's fossil shark's teeth in your backyard. They'll say to me, oh, is that what they are? Um, so they're a lot more than just shark's teeth. They're really um, barometers for the behavior of our planet. I just wanted to suggest that, you know, the think tanks, what they really do is they're semiotic machines, you know? They come up with semiotics to cast the arguments of science out of the public discourse, right? That's exactly what some of those think tanks the, are. The science is so strong. It yeah. just shouldn't be that easy. It's been too easy for well, that. But here's what I suggest. Create a semiotic think tank for science I, right? that uses the language right. and, and rebuts. I mean, I think that there have been times in our contemporary popular culture in the last, say, 30, 40 years, I feel like when I was growing up, it might be the people that I was hanging out with or whatever, the balance was in the other direction. It wasn't so conservative, it was not so against science. There was a lot of openness to science, openness to possibility, openness to the future, and you know. So I think the issue is to create a semiotic institute that can take science and make these little quips. You know, your example, that's a semiotic example. You're putting one thing together with another thing and saying this is inarguable, you know, come on. 
this is ridiculous what you're saying. But you know, I'm not. I wouldn't be good on this panel. This semiotic. <laughs> I'm not the guy, all right? But there are people whose whole purpose is to create the semiotic, you know, arguments. I, I just wanted to say that, um, sadly, sometimes it takes a couple of 103 degree days, and we get them, but when we get some of those really hot summers or heat waves, uh, people start, they start taking these things seriously, and we're gonna see more of that, and, uh, storms that are fueled by more moisture in the atmosphere. So I think it's just a matter of time. Until we have a storm and then they flip back. <laughs> right, and then we get a big snowstorm. That's true. So There's an explanation for this warm winter. Right. It's, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lack of understanding. But also, sci scientists, their job is not typically to communicate to the public. So there, there have been a lot of organizations that have have taken over that role of how do we communicate science, how do we work with the public, so. I would encourage a lot of you uh, artists in the audience or scientists to collaborate with some of your peers and find solutions to these problems because uh, you guys are the future solutions. Um, does anyone have any other questions before we wrap up? I want to thank the panelists for their time. I think that's a very interesting.